Skin. <laughs> okay, so uh, hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, workshop, Visible Learning Best Practice or Boon Doggle. Uh, we're going to talk about challenges in assessing a meta-meta analysis. Uh, my name is Andrea Kalmendal, and I'm a PhD student at Linnaeus University in Sweden. Uh, my main work is uh, on a meta level in psychology and educational research. So I do um, this assessment of visible learning, but I also conduct a meta-analysis and uh, building some future platforms in order to share data within educational research. And with me today is Thomas Nordström. Yeah, I work as a senior lecturer at the same university. Uh, and <clears throat> Sorry. And this project is also together with Rickard Karlsson, who is joining us uh, in the audience here. So let's start. Yes, so uh, today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what visible learning is for you who hasn't been in contact with this previously. Uh, we're going to talk some about uh, what a meta-meta analysis is and the focus there. Um, some pitching of own articles, obviously. So we're going to throw in some current state of educational meta-analysis um, and then wrap it up with this uh, workshop where we are planning to uh, go through the code sheet and um, all the aspects we are thinking of when we are assessing this uh, huge work and uh, with some conclusions. So, and I think that uh, it's easiest if you have any questions that we take them directly. So you can just write in chat or yeah, say anything or so if you need more explanation in some parts. Um, all right, so uh, in 2009, John Hattie released the meta-meta analysis visible learning, uh, which by the time uh, summarized 800 meta-analysis into 138 possible influences on student achievement. But uh, visible learning grew very quickly and by uh, several updates uh, and uh, in 2021, it contained 322 influences and based uh, over 1,800 meta-analysis. And now in 2023, uh, we see that a sequel is uh, also going to be released. So the idea of this list is that uh, the influences uh, were all coded uh, to a standard metric, uh, Cohen's D and ranked based on the size of the effect size. So it ranges from negative, like retention, uh, and a little effect could be like student personality according to the list and a strong influence on students' achievements, which could be like response to intervention. And so the ranking now is used in over 23 countries around the world and um, the original book from 2009 received over 22,000 citations on Google Scholar. So it's easy to say that the impact of this work cannot be overstated. Um, it is also safe to say that Hattie's work in this uh, contribute to a more evidence-based uh, focus in educational research and um, uh, especially with the summaries of all these quantitative analysis. And um, it was, although met with a lot of skepticism from start and uh, was considered very controversial. Uh, the criticism was fierce. Some of them went too far and called it pseudoscience uh, due to the lack of scientific method and statistical coherence in the way of the synthesis was conducted. So a meta-meta analysis is, uh, is uh, visible learning shows similarity to this, uh, which is also known as like a second order meta-analysis or some call it an overview of reviews. It could be an umbrella review or simply a meta-analysis of meta-analysis. And uh, one of the major statistical goals um, is 
to um, determine the variance in mean effect sizes across different meta-analysis of the same relation so that it's due to sampling error and use this information to improve and estimate in each individual meta-analysis so the effect size coming out could be more accurate according to Smith and O. And um, however, there is no methodological standards of how the reporting guidelines should be in, in this. Um, we work a lot with uh, materials from Cochrane that we try to translate uh, as well as Campbell do uh, into educational research. And Cochrane states that the overview should not simply be a summarize of systematic reviews, but rather integrated and synthesized evidence. And one should not really try to rank the inter interventions. So um, to produce an accurate review, you need to specify your PICOs very narrowly. And in order to include overlapping data, the recommendation is to use maybe one of the newest reviews that has most recent published or highest quality or the most outcome data. So it's used to uh, map the available evidence or reanalyze specific uh, data specific subgroups or so. Um, and there is no real satisfying method to actually integrate results across different meta-analysis as is done in this work. So the visible learning uh, as presented, it looks like this. Uh, so this is a influence called uh, reducing class size. Uh, so this is the data that um, visible learning is presenting online as material and uh, yeah, the, um, for their analysis. So what they do is here, they have gathered eight meta-analysis in the topic of reducing class sizes. So we see that they, uh, the, the only thing that they actually um, present is the journal title, the authors, which country the authors come from, uh, the article name, which year, the variables that are supposed to be extracted from the meta-analysis, uh, the number of studies included uh, when calculating this variable, the number of students, number of effects, and also the effect size. Uh, and what one can see straight from this is that it's missing data points from start. Uh, we see uh, some of the studies here actually stated there is no students included. Um, and uh, that could be a type error, of course, but when the full um, confidence of the synthesis is based on, for example, numbers of students, and you don't report the actual numbers of students, I think the, the overall confidence in this sense uh, doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. So this is how they uh, yeah, build up trust in, in, in invisible learning, the more the merrier. Um, it's ab always about the highest number is the best and not about the content per se. So um, it's also worth to mention that um, the way they are synthesizing is by simply taking the average effect size of all included meta-analyses and just divided by the number. So uh, there is no weighting or anything uh, as that or no confidence intervals or anything. So it's a very, <laughs> very loosely way to present data. Um, so yeah, Thomas, would you take over here some? Yeah, with that in mind, we have in this group in our lab, we have also uh, scoured um, the area for systematic reviews with meta-analysis, trying to say something about the current state of educational meta-analysis. Uh, that is not part of this specific workshop, but it's um, quite nice to say something about the work we have done. Um, so even though there are different standards, it, all right, there are different level of quality in the meta-analysis that Andre just uh, demonstrated. So we were interested in whether uh, there are 
any systematic reviews with, with meta-analysis that have high quality according to, for example, Campbell organization, um, the definition and methods provided by them or the clearing houses that work on similar topics. Because, for example, Campbell has uh, quite a lot of rigor in the review process that needs to be followed. Uh, and also transparency in reporting and, and sharing of data and so on. So we, we did a small study um, over the last couple of years um, where we only searched for uh, meta-analysis that evaluated effects from methods, intervention and instructions. It came up with 88 um, uh, papers that met those inclusion criteria, and included that we also hand searched for major uh, review journals so we had quite a good sample to to assess out of these only 11% uh, uh, were assessed as having low risk of bias which is a bit re remarkable in its sense. Yes, we, we found uh, meta-analysis of high quality, uh, but most systematic reviews with meta-analysis in this field have a high risk of bias. Uh, that is not good, of course. Uh, so we hope for improvement the coming years. Uh, and there is a link to that preprint um, uh, where you can you know, read a bit more. So yeah, we are interested in, in, in finding good good quality in 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 the systematic reviews in education uh, uh, you can change slide there andre so back to this uh project and the workshop we are talking about now uh, the background for why we are doing this is that uh, it began with that rickard who's also participating here and i went through uh, visible learning uh, because it's quite a remarkable piece of work. It's the largest collection of meta-analysis across any discipline. Uh, and we found a great number of errors or bad practices. Uh, and we won a grant from the Swedish Research Council, where we should focus on critically scrutinize this list uh, and to produce more rigorous evidence, for example, writing a best practice paper uh, originally recalculating the effects from Hattie's list and produce some new systematic reviews with high quality. But <laughs> due to the severity of flaws that we found in visible learning and they grew as time went, uh, went by, uh, we needed to abandon the idea of recalculating the effects because we, we, we had a naive idea that we you should fix uh, had this list uh, and we, we couldn't do that. So instead we uh, went on uh, trying to reproduce the list based on the statistics that Hattie himself provides in the book. Um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> we started reading up about what has been published and also the criticism that has been published against uh, visible learning. And um, we ended up with uh, wanting to ask the question what the quality of the aggregation and coding of the effects from included meta-analysis for the influences in visible learning uh, with the regard to these uh, quality indicators. And these uh, indicators are stuff that has been built up as a general criticism towards this list. Um, for example, to what extent the PICO, the participant intervention comparison and outcomes in the list, uh, in the included meta-analysis are relevant to the actual definition that uh, visible learning state. Uh, we have seen some, uh, there are previous examples, we will also see an example of this where it doesn't really match. Um, and also to what extent randomized controlled trials, quasi-experimental studies and observational studies has been mixed, um, which is also um, a mistake to do when it comes to comparing effect size. Um, and that comes with the same idea of having effect size from different designs within, between and correlational. Um, so th the main focus would be like, can we actually reproduce the 
reported statistics in visible learning um, with the information are given um, and to what extent the meta-analysis has a wide publication year range uh, and if that has been mixed um, so the first steps was of course to organize all the influences with the associated meta-analysis so we have uh, taken the latest update 1.11 and that included around 1900 meta-analysis with 322 influences so we searched through various databases and collected all the papers that we could find there are still some missings due to having included a lot of unpublished um, doctoral thesis or conference papers etc even and master's paper yeah even yeah. master's papers <laughs> and um there's also yeah we will come further into depth what's going on here <laughs> in a bit and uh, we also want to combine this type of assessment that we're doing now with a relevance rating that we are working together with an uh, expert panel uh, that are working in educational research uh, all over the world so we have a panel that has ass assessed each influence by relevance if it's implemented in their educational system if it's wise to do that etc so we want to have more information about these influences in general than just an effect size um, because comparing this as it is it's um, very misleading so uh, we can start first off with the first question that we're asking. So when we start encoding, uh, what we do first, um, we base this on both Simpsons and Bergen's uh, critical approach to this list. And they said that they have found examples of um, analysis that did not share PICOs and are focused on different outcomes, designs and coding, and as well as analyses. So what we wanted to do is to see to what extent does this match on the whole list. Um, previous criticism have been also charged for saying that it's cherry picking. Of course, you can find a bad study in a work that has included 2000 meta analysis. That's not a problem. But to what extent can we see that in general? So the first thing we do is we read up about the definitions that are given by visible learning. So in this case, we're going to take you through our coding um, regarding reducing class size. And the definition would be that it reduces the number of students in the class, often with the aim of increasing the number of individualized student-teacher interactions to improve student learning. So the population here should obviously be students. Uh, and what we found was that all, all papers included the broad term students. However, um, it was a broad range of students, everything from kindergarten to college, and um, that's per se can be a hard crowd to work with. Uh, I mean, there is not unusual to have bigger sub uh, second up and dairy school classes in comparison to kindergarten mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to um, learning. but. Uh, as long as they have defined their PICO as students, um, that's that's fine. And we actually found that all of this had that. And regarding where this was an intervention or exposure, um, we both thought that since the terminology reduces number of students as an active choice, we saw that this should actually be implemented as an intervention. Um, and However, there were some meta-analysis were not actually conducting an intervention, but looked merely at exposed being ex students being exposed to a smaller class size, uh, and then how that uh, correlates to progression or to um, student achievement in any any type. So, in this sense, there is a, a kind of um, decisive no in relevant inclusion of interventions because of not being an intervention obviously uh, we also looked at the control and comparison groups in all the meta-analysis and all the interventions had comparison groups and that's a good good statement <laughs> however since there were um, some 
correlational studies or re regressions, um, those didn't have any comparisons. And even when we read up on the actual comparison groups from the interventions, we could see that comparison groups varied from defining a large group as 20 in some papers, but other studies defined a small class as 20 and below. So here we end up with a comparison group across meta-analysis that actually are as the same size. Uh, so that's that's not a, it's hard to see any changes there <laughs> obviously because there are, it's nothing happening. And it, it, the idea of merging those two effect sizes together doesn't make any sense. Um, and also those who didn't have any, it's hard to, to, to see that. We also saw when we looked at the outcomes, um, some outcomes were only related to year progression uh, as a broad term, uh, but others was uh, more focused on a test or it could be like reading words or etc. So the, those interventions had a specific test tied to the intervention, while broader broader papers had uh, an end goal of progression or 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 any type of general achievement and that's not a problem per se you can absolutely measure student achievement by year progression however that outcome is not comparable to more points on a word count test that's uh, the the idea of comparing those two outcomes together uh, makes it hard to interpret the result should we just say that Hattie is, you know, aggregating everything into a single effect size, regardless how many outcomes there are in, in single papers and so on. And then all the things that we have mentioned now, Andre, is always aggregated into one unit. Yeah, uh, mm. one single number. And uh, as we looked earlier on the confidence level, the more types of outcomes they have, the, the higher the confidence. So the idea is that there's a very, very broad list of outcomes that are mashed together into one single mm. effect size, um, which is, I mean, it makes it almost uh, impossible to interpret what does that mean for me. If, if I want to work with reading, re um, improving my students' reading, and then all the outcomes come from math tests, it, it, it's hard to interpret the effect size. Um, so um, yeah, so far this is what we see here. Um, if we go further, we also want to code what types of study designs that are included and what types of effect size that are included. And this, um, this analysis actually um, ticked all boxes um, and that's not a good sign, I would say. Um, in, in general terms, in order to settle the causality between the variables, it's a good idea to not mix observational and experimental study designs. Uh, correlation is not always caus causalization. That's a fact. So the idea of mixing this uh, without having anything of that in mind um, might be, um, yeah, not so good. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, you have to, it's very hard to not be too critical when working with this, but you, when too much stacks up, you started to wonder uh, general uh, research ethics. Um, oop. So um, the effect size also, we could see that it was mixed between, uh, between effect sizes and within and also correlational effect sizes. Um, mm. But and and the the problem here is since Cohen's D is expressed in standard deviation, um, the different calculations can lead to a wide range of effects. Uh, a study might have, for example, a large between participant standard deviation, but a small within participant standard deviation, and that would alter the effects greatly. And it also answers two different questions: whether you compare two groups with each other or a single student with a pre and post test. Um, And uh, yes, yeah, some areas usually work more with the other and some uh, less, of course. I mean, reading, for example, Thomas, you have talked a lot about within uh, effect size there, right? 
Uh, yeah, here, what do you, yeah, continue. <laughs> yeah, so the, so the idea is not, that there is no better or worse effect size type, it's just mashing them together that makes it uh, not, yeah. not a good idea. The different designs answer to these different types of research questions, uh, and they can't be mashed into a single number, basically. That's the problem here, yeah. Um, so further on in the code sheet, we also want to code whether the publication year, uh, where when are these um, types of articles published and what types of articles are there? Uh, because there's been critics that said that um, the idea of Cochrane, for example, stated that you should have the latest meta-analysis and that should be the most updated one. Uh, we also see that so some critics against not uh, only using peer-reviewed content uh, might be an issue. But um, what we see here, for example, uh, is that if you if you have multiple meta-analysis conducted on a certain topic from different decades, it's not unusual to see the same paper coming up in every meta-analysis. And what we have seen here in uh, also in reducing class size that we saw that there were some original paper included in in same um, different types of meta-analysis so the data is counted several times uh, which would give that study an uh, weighted bias in in how to interpret it and there is nothing that controls for this um, in visible learning synthesis and um, in the end, uh, the idea of counting same studies twice, uh, that's not a good idea. Uh, the type of article what that we saw here was that seven of the published literature was in uh, journal articles and one was a report from the European Commission. So um, I don't have uh, too much to say about that, but the idea of peer review, uh, I think it's a good way and not included unpublished theses or master theses that haven't have any type of peer review in it. Mm. Uh, there it's is no... debatable at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But we can say that the, the, the report from the European Union there or commission there, it wasn't a meta-analysis even. It was no. just a report about different meta analysis so there were no effects that could be extracted from that report uh, which was a, a bit strange since Hattie claims that there were an effect from, from that report yeah uh, that's um, that comes to the to the last issue of this type of assessment is that we, we are trying to reproduce all the figures and um, all the numbers that comes uh, from the analysis. So uh, what we do first is that we have randomized the order of um, which article to code first. So we have uh, a randomized order. So every influences has one sample, randomized sample that we start coding with. And in reducing class size, we ended up with the European Export Network, uh, Leven and Osterbeck. Um, so here we see that um, it was published in 2018, and uh, the item they were extracting was reducing class size by 10. And they claimed to found 16 papers, zero students, 16 influences, and an effect size of 0 0.10. So it's uh, very important to still remember that we are not actually assessing the meta-analysis per se. We are just seeing if we can reproduce the number Hattie extracted from these analyses into his synthesis. So this is not a, um, yeah, this has nothing to do with the conducted meta-analysis or the synthesis is made. We have, we don't assess that per se. But since it was not even a meta-analysis, but merely a report, there were no synthesis in it. So we actually couldn't find any effect size uh, that matched the one that was extracted. Uh, and when we do the effect size extraction, we have three different choices. We have, yes, it does match the PICO. And yes, it does not match the PICO. Because sometimes we've seen that we can find the effect size that we have extracted but that doesn't really belong to the PICO that the influence definition points toward. And that could be examples of 
not being students or not having the same outcome. Sometimes uh, it's just a general effect size for all the variables included, presented, and then they take that one and it, it doesn't really have anything to do with student achievement. So, um, but in this case, we couldn't find any. Uh, we couldn't either find the number of studies it was based on uh, or the students, since it was zero, we do believe that students were involved in this analysis from start, but uh, there were no nothing to extract there. And the number of effects was also very, very hard to extract. Uh, so what we see here, like the, the idea of doing this and, and looking at the total synthesis as we see here is that um, the average down here, it actually adds more uh, studies to the average and it adds population to the population size, which also then in, in this case increases the confidence of the synthesis made by um, visible learning. But if you can't get the numbers right, it's, it's very hard to, to see that. Um, so when we coded the first article, uh, we code to fail because coding everything would be a uh, too time consumed uh, hassle. So we always code until fail. And whenever we can reproduce the first study, we continue until the fail study. So the rest of the code sheets is based on the fail study. We also do metrics where we see how many studies we coded, the total amount of studies and how many papers that are missing in um, because there are a lot of missing papers due to errors in uh, wrong type of article or wrong type of name or anything or it's unpublished literature that we can't get hold of or it's published in book forms etc so it's um, the the material presented is not available completely and that's uh, in general that's what we strive for uh, to have open access data and i would say that this data set is very closed and uh, no one really knows where the figures come from or where the uh, statistics has been extracted from uh, there is no guidelines at all given by the visible learning team so it's hard to reproduce uh, it takes a lot of time to check out or to see subgroup analysis that could be matching the pico and and so there's a lot of assessment in this type of reprodu uh, reprodu uh, reproduction and uh, we're we kind of actually nice in our way of assessing it we want much of it to work but sometimes it's just uh, overwhelming uh, in how to find it or how to calculate the same means um, So in conclusion, um, our preliminary conclusion right now is that uh, the Hattie aggregation does not work at all. Um, what we have understand is that if you want to do this, you should actually conduct a new meta-analysis instead uh, of synthesis effect sizes from several meta-sizes. Just use the same studies, conduct a new meta-analysis, a new aggregation. Um, the reporting standards in order to make it easy for the relevant information to be found that's uh, a good way and in order to do a second uh, degree meta-analysis or meta-meta is to you have to really define the picos for your synthesis very narrowly uh, it's very easy to end up with such a big sample that and when you mash that together it doesn't really speak for any of the population that are included um, don't mistake statistical effect size to practical importance and relevance. Um, that's a given. Just a high number doesn't say anything without context. Um, I mean, the we idea... haven't talked so much about that, but that was the point of the the first uh, the book that he ranked uh, the relevance of each influence based on the size of the effect size. So, and that makes no sense at all because you can't really pick among uh, influences based on how large effects they they have uh, so that's the background to, to 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 that point there we didn't talk about that so much during during the introduction 
No, that's true. I mean, um, the idea of, of mistaking a big effect size for a better influence, that's um, it's a conceptually wrong assume, um, mm. assumption. Um, and especially like when we come to um, uh, an influence like the, the one we have gone through, reducing class size from what? Is it from 50 to 30, to 30 to 20, from five to one? It's, it's mm. very hard to say without any information. And it's very conceptually uh, driven if you should reduce your classes or not. Like uh, Cohen's D of 0 0.5 doesn't make, it doesn't tell you anything independent on your own class. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, so please don't rank effect size based on high or low value. Um, and also don't synthesize the meta-analysis simply by calculating the mean average of the included analysis. It's... Uh, there are ways, better ways to synthesize meta-analysis than this. And uh, if you are promptly eager to do this, at least some weighting or some comparable PCOS should be included. Um, so this is more or less what we thought we bring up for you. So if you have a, any questions uh, to the work here, or if you are working on a uh, meta meta analysis yourself or are interested in this topic um, now is the time to talk nothing written in the chat but perhaps you have some questions Do we have um, uh, mainly an American audience here? Yeah. Uh, um, the visible learning has received quite an impact in, in Europe, for example. What is the current state of, of visible learning in, in the United States? Given that he is not American. Yeah, that is my impression as well, that he is not as popular in the US. Yeah. Uh, we also got a question in, in the question and answer uh, where it's like, does Hattie know about this research and is it impacting in the 2023 release? Um, it, we haven't um, been in contact. We've been trying to get in contact with with him, uh, but we haven't had any success in that. Uh, he usually is very good at dodging critics in general, but uh, from what I saw from the outline uh, from the 2023 release, there are a chapter that's actually called criticism, but since it's releasing now and the latest update on Corvin the one that I have on the web page, I don't see that these issues are going to be handled mm. at all. There mm. is no, there is no, nothing points towards that direction. Um, More questions? Um, and we talked about all the challenges about mm -hmm. assessing a meta meta analysis, really. Um, there How do we find the drive? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, the meta meta analysis is ever, uh, if it's ever possible to be done effectively uh, following, yes, I would say yes. And in that sense, it's more about describing the content and actually um, do, doing, in, in that case, maybe doing subgroup analysis from studies within meta analysis. What we have seen, mm -hmm. the recommendations uh, from Cochrane and Campbell is that if you want to do it, don't just do a new uh, do a new synthesis or 
make it more exploratory in the same of like presenting all the ones in more of a report form than actually doing a new uh, combined synthesis. Uh, that's the tip we have seen so far. All right. I guess we have covered all uh, questions. Do you have any anyone else that has a question or a reflection or some thought about this? Yeah, we have a question or more like a comment. I think this also has implication for peer review of meta-analysis. Mm. Uh, we might add for uh, that uh, since visible learning is a book, it has not undergone peer review if we were perhaps not very clear about that. So I think that that is dodging a lot of things by uh, publish everything in book forms or on web pages and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and that hasn't at attracted enough criticism, I think. But I, I can also agree that, I mean, having this type of uh, assessment in mind while assessing a meta is very, it's a, it's a good best practice to, to actually look at the PICOs and compare the outcomes that you are synthesizing. And especially when you are reviewing a, a meta analysis, I think it's, uh, there are some good points here. Mm. We can write a best practice review report after this study. <laughs> Lesson learned. Lesson learned. Ah, <laughs> oh, there is another question here. Thought I missed that. Uh, based on your findings, are meta meta analysis ever possible to be done effectively following best practices? Perhaps you answered that. Uh, yeah, I was Andre. on that uh, earlier. Thomas. All right. Ah, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They are not, uh, how do you close that? All right, then we don't have anything, anything else to say. Shall we end this session? Yeah, thank you so much um, yeah. for listening. Yeah, if we have any plans, Thomas, to look at other popular studies books that may have not followed practices correctly to continue on this research. It's a good question. Um, I, I haven't seen the, the, the same size of synthesis in other works in comparison to Hattie. I think this is one of the biggest uh, living synthesis there is right now. Um, and we are in somewhat tied to educational research. So we're gonna continue in that track. And in that track, there are mm. nothing alike this one at least. Uh, no, not across disciplines either, I think, because the, this endeavor Hattie has, has done. And, and we should give him some credit, of course, because as you stated uh, earlier, uh, he really brought up the idea of evidence-based, uh, science-based teaching to an, an agenda in, in several, at least European countries, in when the time needed it. But <laughs> it was so sad to say that he brought in so much flaws into it so perhaps the damage is greater than the the benefits from it
Mm. Uh, but we haven't seen any anything like this in, in similar disciplines like in psychology. Uh, perhaps there is, but I think we yeah. should have come across that by now. Yeah, uh, and our, way, yeah. our way to continue this work is more of the living review format that actually that we combine original studies instead of doing a second order meta-analysis. So the idea mm. of creating, for example, uh, community augmented meta-analysis platform where we can update with original studies from start. I think that's a better way to go uh, than just uh, sediment it with these types of studies and this is the result. Mm. So I think the future come. Yeah, I don't think this is how you will conduct meta-analysis in the future anyways. I think that it's, everything is going to be uploaded into a more integrated applications yeah. or, or websites in that sense. There are enough problems to handle to conduct a, a meta-analysis. <laughs> and if you, you combine all different meta-analysis, you're aggregating a lot of flaws into that synthesis. That might be hard to discover even. All right, it's evening in Sweden, uh, so at least I is going to yeah take in, take the weekend off. So see you guys. <laughs>